idea or two that you could share with the group? Uh, Mike Green, 3G Sales and Service, uh, graduate of Texas A&M, uh, managed ranches before I went into consulting and marketing, worked for BBU one year, uh, Texas born and raised, but uh, I'm a Georgia implant now and live right outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, Bruce Robbins, Oklahoma State, you know, no, no problem with A&M really, Texas tonight maybe, but okay. Uh, born and raised in Oklahoma, came to uh, Texas and went to work in the cattle marketing business with Thompson Cattle Marketing. That's how I got involved with Beefmasters. Uh, wonderful job. Went to BBU in 1990, 90 to 94, ran the field staff, and then started my own business and consulting and marketing and more consulting. But that's what I do. Dave Lofton, Florida State. I live in Missouri, and I am uh, half of the Show Me Cattle Services. My partner, Craig Johnson, wanted to be here, but he and his wife, Karen, had a nine-pound, two-ounce boy last week, uh, and they've got three daughters under the age of 10. Karen said, Craig, sure, you can go ahead and come to the convention, and he very wisely said, no, I think I'll stay home and help with the kids. Um, so he sends his condolences, and he'd love to be here. Uh, we market for the two sales of the Ozark and Heart of America Marketing Group, uh, and that's all we do. Um, for the last 40 years, the OHOA sales have been managed by a member of the group, and we're the fourth incarnation of management, but we also are cattle raisers. I've been raising beef masters for 37 years, uh, and we always sell in those sales. So we're helping our group market our own cattle. Derek Frenzel, Temple, Texas. I run a bull development program. We take in about 450 bulls a year, develop them, sell about 375 when it's all said and done. We have two sales a year, one in the spring in Oklahoma, one in the fall down in Brenham, Texas that we just had last weekend. I'm Anthony Mahalski. Uh, I started in the sales management business, did the first sale in 1968. This past August is 50 years. I'm not that old, I just started young. And uh, we've done, uh, over the years, I've done about every breed that's in the United States uh, uh, through the years. Uh, well, I started in management in 1977. I started auctioneering. In those years, we've done about every breed of uh, cattle that's in the United States and, and gravitated to more and more and now almost totally beef master. We do a, a number of replacement sales throughout the year. Um, involved in about probably 40 different events, whether it's uh, sales management, uh, consulting, or, or auctioneering. Okay, after we just heard Wendy, there were a few things that kind of stood out to me right on the beginning of her presentation. Uh, and she's talked about not making promises you can't keep, uh, staying in touch with our customers, and getting to know those customers on a personal basis. Uh, developing that relationship with them. So, question I have for you guys is, the average age of the cattle producers across the country is 50 plus years old. What are some of the things that can be done from a sales standpoint to get some of our younger generation that are busy with other aspects of their life, like family, jobs, uh, more active and to better understand the avenues in which we can, can derive more of a return on cattle? Whichever one of you wants Social to Social media. <laughs> I mean, you heard Wendy, and, and by the way, I think uh, anybody that wasn't in here, Gerilyn, are you recording this whenever Wendy's her talk? Boy, that woman did a wonderful job. She covered every topic that you could ever ask for, in my opinion, that any seed stock breeder can take from what she told you, all those little things, that's how you're going to get any breeder or any potential buyer to your place, working with you, doing what you want to do, is contact. Contact is everything. And now this social media deal, and I'm the first to admit I'm not in it because I don't understand it as well as the young people do, but as a breeder of cattle out there, you need to understand it. You need to be involved with it. That's going to get you in touch with a whole different group a younger generation that, that Colin is talking about, in my opinion. I can echo that. Uh, we've got a Ozark and Heart of America Facebook page, and so we ask every one of the consigners to take pictures of their animals, send it in. 
Craig administers that page, but we can advertise the animals for them in advance of a sale, uh, encourage people to send farm pictures, uh, anything to do with the animals coming into the sale. Uh, we've also got the OHOA website uh, where the information goes, and we also put the uh, sale catalog up uh, on the Facebook page and on the BBU website with Geraldine. I think, uh, go ahead, Anthony. I think uh, Colin asked us about uh, the younger generation and not to put a tag uh, on generations, but most of us up here, I guess, and most of us in the room, 50 plus, were baby boomers. Uh, the generation that creates us the most grief right now, and I'm not trying to put that tag on them by any means, but the millennials are the people that most worry me about our business and exactly what we have to do and what we are supposed to be doing. Um, most of your, our challenges come from the millennial generation. And we need to do a better job of advertising the exact reason why you people sitting out there and us as breeders and salesmen also exactly why are we doing what we're doing. We're not just pet owners. You got to think in the big scope of things. I have a cousin that works at uh, Texas A&M in, in animal research. And she's the one that shared with me the greatest fear in our research through animal science is actually the generation of the people, the animal rights activists that are come out of that generation. And it's only because of lack of education. Um, we're not pet owners. You got to think on a bigger scale. What we're doing, think about the population growth in the world and the land diminishing. You think about what we do, what we're supposed to be doing is identifying our genetics, superior genetics to follow and pass on along to the commercial man to go from grass to plate and do it more efficiently. You have to realize that, that someday and maybe we'll all be gone. But these young people that to be able to take this over have got to feed the free world at some point in time that's what the United States, you could say oil and you can say anything you want to, but if people cannot eat and beef being a very viable source of protein, you know, there's where your problem is. We have to understand identifying things that we're doing through the Beef Foundation, through Beef Checkoff nationally. Those are advertising venues and BBU has set those things in place and telling us the importance of scan data and the efficiency of our cattle and residual feed intake where we can take an animal that's in the feed yard is only going to take five pounds of feed for a pound of gain versus eight. But those are the things that we have got to pass along to this younger generation that how important that is. And through education and advertising, I think that's the only way that we can actually get those young people. We're not worried about the JBBA kids and, and our children and our grandchildren. They already know. Uh, they already love it. But we've got to be able to reach out to people how important what we do in the long scheme of things is. Well, I agree totally with what Mike's saying there, and, and uh, not that we don't don't want to uh, overlook our JBBA program, but just about every breed has a junior program. But this breed probably, if you go to the big uh, shows like Houston, San Antonio, Fort Worth, you'll see that we probably got the uh, strongest junior program and it's impressive when you start listening to the juniors and how much you can learn from them um, you know you look at these kids and, and you know I can look in the room right here now and you may not realize it but there's some kids sitting in kids Trey, kids sitting right here in this room that got their start as junior members and I could name you different ones of them uh, some of those kids that were in the early stages of the, the junior program when it wasn't that big and uh, some of those kids are now off in the finance world, uh, financing agricultural programs and such. And again, you learn from those kids. You can listen to them. They, they, they understand the newer technology, uh, the different things. And I get a big kick out of it when you, when you uh, realize all the media that's out there. I'd be the first one to say that I didn't think we'd ever see the time where we could sell cattle on videos like we do. Uh, didn't believe it would happen. I always thought you had to have the cattle in the ring and smell them and touch them and do the whole bit. And uh, it's evolved through media, through, through uh, all the technology that's out there. Uh, people have become comfortable with it. It's faster, it's quicker, it's dangerous. You have to be careful. 
Uh, I've evolved to the point that many a times, you know, we used to get around and, and it was tough seeing cattle all across the country. Uh, my wife and I still cover about 14 states actively looking at cattle. We used to have to drive that. Now you simply call somebody and say, can you send us some pictures, send us a video. And when you get an old man out there that says, I don't know how to do that. I say, well, get one of your kids. Oh, I can do that. Or they'll get the neighbor's kids. And in a couple hours, you'll have pictures. And these kids, they get involved and they love it. Uh, but, uh, you know, support those juniors. Uh, uh, I'm always impressed how quick they learn, how much they learn, and that we can learn from them. All right. Any questions from the crowd? Wendy, in her presentation a while ago, was talking about this assistance payment program Tennessee has, and she also mentioned how catalogs could be sent in and that approved and they be marked. Is that something that y'all could help us with? Is that something that other states may have assistant programs too that maybe we need to look at to add value to our, our bull sales in that way? Well, it's a, it's a most interesting program, and I'll be honest with you, uh, I was unaware that Tennessee uh, offers what they do. My wife and I came to Tennessee a few months back uh, to talk to a, a group here about a, a replacement program, and that was the first time we became aware of these incentives, and uh, Wendy did a great job uh, explaining that. And it's impressive. Uh, I know that there's some other states out there. Uh, they're not some of the states that are you know, local to the market that we deal in. Uh, that is true of something that's offered in Mexico. Uh, it varies from time to time. Uh, assistance with seed stock cattle, even assistance with uh, uh, commercial cattle. Uh, it's, it sounds complicated and can be, but if you learn it, uh, it, it it's not that way. Wendy, I didn't catch uh, back there. I know that uh, they offer it on bulls, but uh, uh, typically what they're looking for, you have to use bulls with enhanced EPDs. It's just that simple. Some other you know, things you've got to do, but you'll offer, also offer it on females. Uh, if, if, uh, when I met with the folks over at the Ag Center, I think they explained that on females, the, uh, uh, you could get uh, assistance, maybe a little less, as long as they were sired by in bulls that had enhanced EPDs or even if they were simply bred to bulls that had enhanced EPDs. I don't know, if, did you cover that on the females? I didn't get into it too much. So on the bulls, if you do not have genomically enhanced EPDs, you can get up to $1,200 still on call share. As long as I think it's a 0.15 accuracy. If you have genomically enhanced EPDs, you can get up to $1,600 on a bull. On the heifer side, the heifers had to be sired from a bull that would pass ag enhancement qualifications and have to be bred to a bull that would pass ag enhancement qualifications. On the heifers, you can get up to $200 a heifer, up to $2,000. So that's 10, you could buy 10 heifers and get $200 cost share a piece on those. Or you can mix and match. We have a lot of producers that will do $1,600 on a bull and then they might have bought two heifers that qualify and they'll get $400 to max out their 2,000 on that. I always try to be careful. You asked about uh, listing information in catalogs and such. And um, to do so, you really have to be aware of the program and be able to answer those questions. Uh, my concern is that, uh, that someone will have the perception, because we put it in the catalog, that they qualify uh, for some of those things. And, and what I would do is to encourage them, if I listed it there, of course, you know, we're in Texas, but we offer, you know, we're, we're in all those other states, people can come from from Tennessee and, and have that assistance, but my recommendation would be to get with Wendy or someone here in, in Tennessee so that you're aware of exactly what you have to do to qualify for those things. Get that done cleared and clarified up front before you, you make your purchases.
So I just want to clarify, if they were to answer Greg's question, if he was to send you his sale catalog, y'all would look at it and mark the cattle? Greg, there's your answer. You got that catalog, give it to Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. The only thing that you'd have to be clear, we, you know, with technology, we sell typically, it's not unusual to have someone or have buyers from two, three, five, or eight states in a particular event. But if you live in Arkansas, you don't qualify for Tennessee support. So you've got to know that, you know, some of, those, uh, some of that information or that it's a state that you're from. I mean, a lot of this is uh, monkey see, monkey do, and, and uh, I think she would tell you that once the neighbor sees it and, and you're out there using a Beefmaster bull, then it's okay for you to use one. Um, you know, a, a guy that we've got to give a lot of credit to, and, and several of them, is Steve Carpenter, Bill Pendergrass, and Colin for getting us in the Noble Foundation. I mean, I think that once that ball starts rolling and the guys see these calves coming through the ring and they're Beefmaster sired, then all of a sudden it's going to be okay to use them in Oklahoma. Uh, it's a big fight, so one of my bull sales is in Oklahoma, I sold 16 bulls out of 90-something bulls one year in Oklahoma, so it's not a hotbed for us. You know, they were coming from other states and, and so forth. It's a central location, but, you know, the state of Oklahoma itself is not, you know, real Beefmaster friendly, and I think the more programs we have like that that gives everybody the okay to use our bulls is going to help grow us. I've been uh, in the Ag Enhancement Program since day one. If you look on my cell uh, pens out there, I've got a, a sign up that says Master Beef Producer. Now, this is a great program for the state of Tennessee, so I would urge you to uh, impress upon your congressman to go to your state representatives to uh, maybe get this program uh, implemented in your state. But it's not, uh, you just don't pick the phone up and say, well, I want to apply for twelve hundred dollars for to buy a bull it's not that simple uh, they're very diligent in making sure that you do your part as producer so you're gonna have to have a premise ID you're gonna have to have a BQA uh, registration number um, there's a process to that and then the educational side uh, you, you're gonna have to put in some time to go to classes for this you know here in the state of Tennessee but one thing about it, uh, it, it allows you to, as a producer in the state of Tennessee, to be able to select and choose what areas you need help in. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, they like to broke me the first five years uh, applying for all those programs. And uh, I tried to get them to pay 75%, but they wouldn't do it. But uh, it's, a, it's a great program here for the state of Tennessee, and we're very fortunate to uh, to have the program but Wendy has a ton of uh, information that can help you even though you're not in the state of Tennessee just as you've seen through her presentation so um, they'll be glad to have you as much as they can one of the things that I'd like to say also is there are extension B specialists in every state in the US uh, make sure you utilize those guys. Wendy said, yes, we have field reps, and yes, they're out daily almost visiting ranches, but for those that, that may not have someone on the place with the association or, or it may be on a limited basis, you have resources out there from your county extension agents that are on a local day-to-day -day level to beef cattle extension specialists, and, and there's no better way, like she said, to, to get in front of those people. It's amazing how many calls that those guys get and ask or help locating genetics that they're looking for. Yeah, a lot of our seed stock guys know where they want to go or know what genetics they want to use, but there's a lot of commercial producers out there and talking about the age and how things are changing as the baby boomers are starting to retire and they're starting to go back to ranches and back to family properties. Uh, some of those guys don't have a lot of background, especially as you get to my generation and then certainly the millennials. Uh, as we as we progress through these generations, uh, there's less and less volume of people out there that have a background in ag. 
uh, they go and they do something that's more lucrative, uh, that they don't have to be on a ranch and haven't been afforded the opportunity to make a living there. So uh, certainly use these guys and make sure that there's an opportunity out there to, to get in front of your local extension specialist, uh, your county agent, or whoever it may be. So. You're going to hate him for giving me this mic. <laughs> of course, that's what I'm here for. Uh, you guys are the focal point in marketing cattle in, in our association. And I, I'm sorry for you because I know that what you do, you're under a magnifying glass all the time. In little, and by magnifying glass, any little perceived perceived mistake you've made is ultimately magnified across this breed. But you are responsible for a, the major part of our marketing with these cattle. And I know ultimately your job is to make money for your consignment. And it, it always has been. That's how you make a living. You're not in here just to promote beef masters. You're in here to make a living. But I know you guys, all of you, ain't near as dumb as you look. But y'all are y'all are well aware of what the, the cattle industry needs and what we need to do to, to promote, promote our breed in the commercial industry. I'm just wondering how are you coping with some of some of us dummies that don't utilize all the tools we need to use to measure our cattle, uh, DNA, uh, simply weighing our cattle. All those things that we need to be doing, a lot of us aren't doing. I, you know, a, a, a defined breeding season. So how are y'all coping with that and, and encouraging your customers to do those things, those that aren't, I know many do, but how are you encouraging them to do that? Because I know that, you know, if you make a mistake, boy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna divorce Mike and marry Bruce. And then I get mad at Bruce and I run back, I run to Anthony then I get mad Anthony and then I recycle them. I know how this goes, but I, you know, it's a difficult job. I just wonder how you're coping with it and how you, how you're getting across to your, to your customers to do those things we need to do. Are we compatible? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid to answer that. Right yeah, I know. <laughs> There's little been in, some unresolved stuff there, there that uh, I don't want to go there. I know. One on one, you know, each of us have customers that we visit, uh, Y'all see us at the sales, walking around with a clipboard and a sports jacket. And, yeah, and that's all we do, right? Uh, the rest of the time, we're away from home and we're on customers' places, you know, trying to get them to understand the tools that they can use to enhance the marketing of their cattle. That's one way to do it, but we don't get to everybody, obviously. But the main thing is, how those people come around to that uh, mark is when they see the cattle sell, whether it be private tree or even in the sale ring, whichever, and those people that are utilizing the tools and their management practices, obviously, are doing a better job of marketing and their cattle bring more money, to me, that's the biggest thing we can do. Uh, the guy sitting out there that goes, well, why does so-and-so's animal bring twice what mine does there's a lot of variables obviously but what if that guy that's selling those cattle for more he's got the right product he's got it's looking right 
he's got all the tools, all the scan data, all the performance, everything else. He set himself up to be the guy everybody wants to be, and his cattle are going to bring more. To me, that's the, that's the biggest way uh, to get people to understand what they need to do to market their cattle. It's been that way forever. You know that. You've been around here forever. The, the final word or the final gavel is the sale ring, right? Well, getting to that sale ring is the biggest deal, and, and Wendy had a great point that, golly, you know, I preach it every day, a plan. Get a plan. Work the plan. My goodness. You got commercial breeders that do it every day. We got seed stock breeders. I see them all the time. Don't have a plan. Don't even think about a plan. You got to get a plan. You got to work the plan. You got to collect data. You heard her say it today. It wasn't one of us saying it to you. This is somebody else saying it. Data is everything. And the more you collect, the more answers you get that you can lay out in front of somebody, no matter what their preference is whether it's actual data, whether it's EPDs, whatever. If you think you don't have to collect data, you watch what happens in the sale ring of the cattle that have data and don't have data. It's just that simple. What has presentation and doesn't have presentation. You gotta take those steps, you gotta have a plan, you gotta work a plan. Well, you know, and there's so much to that. Uh, you know, how do we get people to, do, to doing those things? Uh, I'll be honest with you, for the most part, like Mike said, the marketplace does that. Uh, when you go to a sale and, you know, we hear the question all the time, why does his cattle sell them so much higher? You know, uh, why can't mine? Just because you've got one in a sale doesn't make it better. Uh, and if you, most, 99% of the time, if you study and, and look at those cattle, the cattle that sell on top end, they're prepared right, they've got measured, they've been measured, they've got everything that you want in the end of those cattle. Uh, people have done their homework. People are here today because you're here to learn. You're here to, to listen and, and find something that you can take back to your program. And a lot of times what we do, like uh, uh, Mike said, what you see here at the sale is the end result of what we do. You know, a lot of these sales, we're starting three months ahead of time, uh, four months ahead of time. But we've all got sales that are booked for next year and two years out and three years out. Uh, so, you know, we, we do a, a lot of... Uh, advising to customers we uh, answer a lot of questions we try to stay knowledgeable in the field to be able to answer those questions about certain you know tools or things that people are going to incorporate into the program some people will try to incorporate everything that's out there and others will incorporate parts of it but each part that they incorporate into it adds value to their cattle um, so you know when you when you get to the sale again you're seeing the end result of it uh, but it, we all take a lot of pride in. I know uh, Bruce and Mike and Derek and everyone has sales. I'm dealing with some customers that uh, uh, right now I'm dealing with the fourth generation uh, in one family. Uh, when I started, I was real young, the older man that was there. But, you know, we take a lot of pride. But over those years, uh, I've watched them grow from one program and incorporating those different things and bringing ideas. And it's a family that hardly ever gets out of South Texas but a lot of the things they're doing down there, uh, you know, whether they find it or we talk about it and they'll go and look into it and such, but, but uh, the, the marketplace pushes you and everyone to, you know, the, trying to find those advantages uh, to make your cattle simply worth more. And Mike and I aren't near as old as Anthony. <laughs> in, in our bull development co-op, have, we have some some kind of strict standards to get into it, which is you know a little bit more difficult than what these guys to each side of me can do, uh, dealing with the sales they do. But everybody has to be enrolled in whole herd reporting, which means that you turn in a weaning weight on every one of your calves. Um, we bring them in, we run them through a grow safe system, collect feed efficiency data on them. Um, once that's complete, then we ultrasound them so we have yearling weight, scrotal measurements, scan data, the whole nine yards in the catalog. You know, I tell my guys there's a reason that we put a uh, you know, EPD graphs in there and, and percentile rankings in the catalogs. I mean, I, I look through a lot of these catalogs and, and I see that the guy can't even take the time or, or effort to take a wean and weight or scan that on, a, on an animal. And it makes you really wonder, you know, a lot about that animal or, or that program. If he didn't take time to wean that calf or weigh that calf when he weaned him, did he take the time to haul that cow off? She had a bad udder, didn't breed back. So, um, you know, it's kind of like checking all the boxes. Um, you know, I, I tell my guys, don't settle for average. If, you, if that animal's got a average weaning weight, who in here settles for average? Nobody. 
So, um, you know, why when you're, we're looking through these cell catalogs and you're seeing these, you know, mediocre weaning weights or, and especially EPDs, which will really tell the story, I mean, why are, why are you guys, you know, as a, as a breeder, why aren't we trying to progress and, and get those genetics to the full potential? So that's what I would encourage you to start paying attention to. First off, let me say that you're absolutely right. Uh, all of us get paid on a commission basis. And uh, I guess you could say that a sales manager is kind of a cross between a real estate agent and a used car salesman. One of the things that we faced when we first took over the... Thank you. What? <laughs> when we first took over the sale three years ago uh, for OHOA, uh, it had a, an established bull test where bulls are delivered in uh, December and sold in April. Uh, and it's really nothing more than a feed gain test. Uh, but this organization was founded 40 years ago by a bunch of good old boys who were selecting cattle on the appearance of muscling, and that's about it. And when I do the catalog, all those little boxes, half of them would be empty. There wasn't any data on them. Uh, people would have to, you have to explain to people what ultrasound data was. And our advantage is that we've got a, an organization and a board of directors that is slowly changing. We've got more and more of the younger people coming in and anybody that acts interested in the 30-something crowd. We're trying to get involved, give them something to do, and utilize them, and we've got several of them on our board now. So our demographics are changing. And starting next year, the board has voted to make it a requirement that every bull that comes into that test has to have scan data. A lot of the old guys are crying big time about it now. Um, and Dusty's doing what he can to help us set up field days for scan, because up in our neck of the woods, it's tough to find somebody to come do scanning data. So we're providing those stations where we can set it up at someone's ranch that's got the scales and got the facility. Anybody from 50 to 75 miles around, bring your animals that day and get them scanned. So that's what we're trying to do to help the guys get the data. Because they're not going to be able to put bulls in the sale unless they've got it. Uh, the Central States uh, Board of Directors voted last year to require that starting well, this coming spring, every animal with the exception of the older cow pairs has to have scan data to be eligible for the sale. So the way for consignment sales and organizations, you guys can do it yourselves just to help educate your people and to let them know this is what you've got to do. If you want to be a seed stock producer, you've got to start collecting data. You can't just coast along with it as a hobby anymore or, as Mike said, a bunch of pets. Uh, yeah, you, there may be pretty cattle standing in your pasture, but unless you want to do the work the seed stock producer needs to do, you might as well just be a commercial guy looking at the cattle out in your pasture. that BBU is going to help us get scan data because we lost our scanning lady in, in this area of the southeast and we one person managed to get UT to scan for us and they I think they'll go on doing that but um, what what is BBU I mean I know they got lots of people scan in Texas but what is BBU doing for the rest of the country so that does become a challenge uh, and there, there are a few in Texas, but I'll tell you, there's, there's two of them in Texas that spend more time in the Midwest and Florida than they do in Texas. Uh, and trying to schedule those guys is a challenge, to say the least. So we are trying to work with satellites and marketing groups, as Dave mentioned, uh, set up some of these days that, yes, you're probably going to have to travel, and it's not the most ideal scenario, especially if you have to travel a long ways, and if that conditions are adverse, if it's really cold or really hot, uh, but we're trying to do more of that to consolidate it so that our members can go to one place and have a feasible fee that they have to pay to get that taken care of and get those cattle scanned. Uh, we work consistently with uh, BIF and within BIF standards. Uh, there's an ultrasound guidelines council that we're members of uh, that we try to work with as well. I know they've gone through some changes in recent years. Uh, some of their qualification standards have changed a little bit, so it's become a little bit more difficult. Uh, it takes a little bit more time to get certified to be a scan tech, uh, but we'll continue to try to set those up. Uh, I know that our commercial marketing group and our seed stock marketing committees, excuse me, uh, are both working and trying to effort more field days, more events, and we'll just call them scan days. So as we can get more of those put together, uh, you know, John has a, a place that we can all go that day, and we have a scan tech lined up, and we'll try to get those cattle scanned for you. 
But the best thing that I could say is plan ahead, you know, and it, it goes back to a lot of a lot of different things, but the simple management things that Wendy talked about from defined calving seasons uh, to know when those cattle are going to be born, it becomes more of a challenge if we have cattle born year around to try and get someone there on a routine basis. So if we know we have a defined calving season out there, we can go through and start to to try and, and have an idea when we're gonna have somebody around and we can schedule around that year after year after year. Karen, I would call Wendy. <laughs> yeah, I think Wendy has a comment. I would absolutely pick up the phone. I usually tend to talk extremely loud without them, so I can't that close. Um, so you can get online and find the list of, of cup techs who are eligible. I will say not all techs are created equal, as y'all know. Um, Everybody looks at data in a different way. So uh, before you just call one off of that list, I would definitely try to find somebody um, in your area. We are blessed, as you mentioned, at UT. Uh, we had uh, one of our employees at our Heifer Development Center in Lewisburg that, that received their qualifications. And so they've started scheduling a couple of those days um, to help some other producers in our state. So I think that's something that could be developed if you reached out to people in your area. Who knows, you might have a college kid that's coming out looking for a job, that that might be something that, that could be needed in your specific area. But like I said, I would get um, recommendations from other breeders before I just pulled off the Cup Lab listing to know um, how, how they work. See, I would ask her. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mac had a question up here. gentlemen. Uh, this is my first convention. Uh, I was really blessed uh, to come out and sit in on the board of directors meeting uh, and I got to get some um, a, a deeper understanding of the, the breed's marketing plan uh, and what I realized was I understood what the breed was doing on their marketing plan. I understand a lot what breeders in the room are doing because I see a lot of stuff on social media. Uh, I see a lot of consigners that are consigning to your sales. They promote their animals a lot um, and, and though you run the sales I was curious, out of the commissions that you receive, how much of the commission or how far does commission fees go into advertising? Uh, because the second part of this is I do a lot of data trolling. Uh, so when I see a lot of stuff, because I'm always curious about the surrounding states that, that affect me, I'll see uh, a lot of private treaty stuff coming up online on social media or within Craigslist as well. Um, but from the major consigning sales, uh, I, I'll see like beef on Florida pop up in Florida's cattlemen. I'll see it. And then there'll be multiple shares, I'll see some, but very minimal uh, advertising I see on the social media side going to like Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, I, I, I don't see any unless Next General is one of them, I see Beef and Forge again. And then just some of your sales, I, I really don't see. No, so first off, the dollar go? Or, or what percentage of consignment fees go towards that helps the people that consign to your sales? Uh, first off, let me say I had the pleasure of meeting this gentleman two days ago at the, the board of directors meeting and he is currently on leave because he's a full-time employee of the U.S. Army, um, still serving. <laughs> and his intent when he gets out of the Army is to be a beef master breeder. So he's doing his due diligence and homework. So thank you very much. Um, I can tell you how it works with, with our sale. Um, we try to, one of the things we're known for is trying to keep the sales commissions as low as possible. Uh, on our spring sale that had 180 lots in them. Um, by the way, there were 17 first-time consigners in that, in that sale. We had 150 lots in the fall uh, sale with uh, 10 first-time consigners. All of the advertising we do, uh, all, everything that's spent for that sale goes into sales expenses. Uh, we consistently keep the sales expense between 10 and 12%. Now that's going to vary depending on the, the amount of dollars that the sale grosses. And of course, as the market is coming down and, and the sale average may be coming down, your sale gross may be coming down. So that's, that's really tough. So we have to watch where we're spending the advertising dollars. Um, we don't buy a full page ad in the Beefmaster Cowman. We figure a half page ad is going to do it. That's going to reach all the, the BBU members. We spend our dollars on local advertising in our area, like the Midwest Cattleman newspaper, the Farm Talk newspaper, uh, the Joplin Regional Sales News that has a 20,000 circulation to just cattle people. And we'll buy full-page co-op ads with uh, the BBU co-op program 
they will pay uh, a percentage of the, of the cost of a full page ad and we'll get 10 consigners and put their names and phone numbers on that full page ad and Geraldine will, will do it up for us. Uh, and each consigner then will pay uh, a small percentage of the ad. So really only about 25% of the cost of a full page ad in a big uh, publication will go toward sales expense. And we're utilizing DBU dollars doing that. Uh, so that really helps with the, with the expense of advertising. And then we can do things like, like send out mailers. I know that Wendy wasn't a, a fan of those, but for the local County Cattlemen's Association, just getting a postcard in the mail saying, hey, we're having a sale coming up in, in two weeks, uh, 100 bulls, 100 females, uh, come see us in Springfield, Missouri, or come see us in Locust Grove, Oklahoma. Uh, and we get a lot of uh, commercial guys that way, because we know we've got the BBU people's attention already. They're gonna come you know, to a seed stock sale. But we try to target the commercial guys in our area, and that's helping expand the buyers in our area. Mac, uh, to answer your question, question we found that uh, most of these sales have a track record, so we pretty much know what they're going to gross. And so by knowing that already, we try and, and get our advertising budget in there where, where it's livable with sale expense. But to answer your question, uh, you're looking at anywhere between 3 and 5 percent is it goes to advertising. Uh, Kendall McKenzie, I have a question. We, uh, most of us go back to the day where we bought just by visual appraisal. There's been a big change in our breed, and I, I believe it's the right direction to go, but I have a question. We, we've talked about all this data we need to collect, and a lot of us are really trying hard to do that, put performance data into our cattle to show what they can do. How much has this performance data affected the sale day prices that you I can see some very different answers coming from some of you, possibly, but I'd like different ones to respond. How much this performance data has affected the prices on the sale day that you have? Well, you know, it, and that's a good point. Uh, it's having a big effect. Uh, every day it becomes bigger. Uh, there was a time that we, like you said, everybody made their selection on a visual appraisal. Uh, over the years, uh, some of the earlier tests, they might have started doing gain tests and, and then evolved from there. There's, there's so much out there now. And you know, when it comes to marketing, uh, uh, when you look at a catalog, it's hard to explain. One of the things I'd point out too, when you get someone to the farm or whether it's at a sale, if you're there, uh, I, I deal with so many people who are interested in buying and their first question is, how do I understand that? And uh, so, you know, be knowledgeable there, but back to your, your question, um, if, if, you were, if you're in the seed stock business, it's a seed stock business. Those are, you know, exactly that. And so you want to have as much as you can possibly offer that, that you can tell those people about the cattle. And the way you do that is to measure them, to weigh them, to, to you know, be able to pr provide that information. There's a lot of buyers out there that don't have any comprehension of it yet, but they will. And as they learn it, uh, once they learn it, if you haven't got it, you're too late. So as seed stock breeders, we need to be prepared and, and looking for those new tools, uh, the new EPD or the new uh, scan information and such. And, and we need to comprehend it so that when those buyers uh, ask the question, one, that we can explain it to them so they understand it and know how they want to use it in their program. But uh, you have to build that, that basis uh, you know, whether it's EPDs or all that information there, uh, the more data we uh, gather, the more we put into the computer that we can provide, the more effective is it is, that it is. So uh, it's having its effect. One of the things I deal with a lot of people who uh, they may not understand it and such, but even the guy that used to say, well, it doesn't matter. I'll look at the bull and look at this and I want to look at his fertility test. But uh, he's evolved to the point that 
if he doesn't understand it, he wants to know that it's there. He wants to know that you spent the time gathering that information because it's meaningful to him. If it's not there, you know, he, the first question is, you know, well, what kind of program is it, it, is it? You know, he didn't get a birth weight. He didn't bother to get a weaning weight and such. Uh, so the more information you can, you can provide to him, uh, the, the, the stronger that animal becomes on a seed stock basis. I would concur with him, and the impact is, is real. The impact is there, right? Now, from sale to sale, from production sale to consignment sale, sure, there's a change. And it's different. The bull sales, the different way they handle them. But the impact is real. Putting a, putting a finger on how much that impact is, impossible. But the first time you have some guy that walks up and says, what was his yearling weight and you didn't have it? Or what was his IMF and you don't have it? Or what was his ribeye area per hundred and you don't have it? You may have potentially lost that customer. That's why you've got to get the data. It's available to get it, it's hard to get. But we have always been visually appraisal oriented, right? And that's worked against us, in my opinion, at this point, because we all got very comfortable with it, right? Well, well, we've got to all evolve. It's time, it's past time. And you're seeing it all the time, data, data, data. That's what you need and you got to take the steps to try to get it. And, a lot of times it's going to be hard or impossible, but when you're in different points of the area, like Karen was bringing up, they lost their scan person. But, you know, that's part of the seed stock business. We're in a different world. we got to figure it out. And, Kendall, I think we need to put all the tools together. You know, it is having a big impact, but uh, people still like to buy what they'd like to look at. And if they're going to pay good money for it and it's in their pasture, they want to be structurally correct, whatever they want. Okay, so we got to have that with the other tools to make it more marketable, you know. Well, at this point in time, I and mean, what we're doing, where we're at in our infancy you know, with the, with the numbers and the data, uh, and I think I'm right in saying it that way. Uh, w at this point in time, we've got to put together the animals because of what's selling in our breed. We've got to have the right structure. Uh, we have to have, at this point in time, some marketable pedigree that's been proven, predictable. We've got to have the numbers to go along with it. And not just numbers, that's something that I think a lot of you don't understand. It's, it's, you got to get the data, but to get in the data, you got to identify the inferior cattle with the data. And so that anybody that thinks that just because they scan their animals, you know, and they put them in a sale, they ought to bring more money. Well, if your scan data is is less than average, you haven't done. I mean, you still got to get it, but you're not going to enhance your marketability. We got to identify those cattle. But that's what I think this breed where we're at right now is, uh, and there's breeders that are obtaining this. You know, they've got the right kind of cattle that they can sell. They got the right kind of marketability and genetics that are proven that they can sell. And now they're instilling uh, numbers and identifying particular cattle and lines that can excel. But you know, you have to uh, still go back to the visual appraisal thing. Uh, I think we all see it. Many sales, you get so many different kinds of buyers that walk up. I've had people that walk up and they'll have a catalog completely marked and they'll they, you know, they may have marked it based on pedigree. They may, may, may have marked it based on strictly EPDs or, or one particular EPD or, a, uh, you know, based off dollar T or dollar M. Uh, but there's a lot of people that'll walk up there and, and uh, they'll, you know, they'll go through the cattle uh, based on, on a visual basis and they're going to select the cattle that look like they want to look. Then they're going to sit down and look, do they have the performance? And some people do it the other way. If they don't have the performance, they don't bother looking at them. You really have to have an animal that's, that's well-rounded. You know, like Mike said, uh, you know, we're, we've, we've all been trained to, uh, as much as we can, to visual appraisal. We've all trained ourselves to look at pedigrees. And we're training ourselves. There's so many other tools out there. But it's going to be the guy that offers it all that's going to always do the best. Because you're going to have a buyer that looks for each one of those different categories. And when you have the complete animal that's measured, that's all those things, it's going to have your best value. 
Well, let me say one thing. The, what I told you about with the, with the bulls and all of our commercial buyers, that's one of the reasons that the board of directors voted to go with requiring all the scan data because the number one complaint from those commercial guys was there was no data. And regardless of how good it looked, they weren't going to buy it without the data. Now, Mike's absolutely right. You've got to have both because they want a good-looking animal, and it may have good data and, and still look like a, it ought to be a steer. Um, and conversely, I've seen good animals, and we, we had one in a central state sale two years ago where a bull, two sim very similar bulls, one with data sold for 3,700, the one without data sold for 15. All right, Kendall, just for you. No, I, so I, I couldn't agree more. So we, we push performance to the limit. I mean, we're, we're totally performance. But I will say the first thing that I tell every one of my co-op guys is phenotype is number one. So everything else is icing on the cake. And I think we see that. You'll see it in Trey's cell in a couple of weeks. You saw it in our cell. When you've got a bull up there and he's a solid color, he's got a good phenotype, all of a sudden you start checking these other boxes. Good IMF, good ribeye, good performance. All that, you're boosting that bull another 2,000 to 5,000, each one of those boxes. And that's when we start seeing these bulls selling for $20,000 or 20 plus thousand dollars is because they do go in there. You know, I've got guys that tell me, oh man, that bull, you know, they'll show up just like Anthony said with, with their bulls already marked off. And I mean, they're a goat, you know? I mean, they're the, the IMFs are not very good or whatever it might be, and they're at the back of the sale. That's not what you need. You gotta have that phenotype, you know, to, to get where you need to go. And uh, you know, there, there, there's so many boxes to check now. You can't just say, I've got to go have the best ribeye, or I've got to go have the best IMF, or I've got to go have the best wean and weight. There's just a lot of boxes that go into it. And when those bulls really excel, and I, I think we're seeing that, a lot, a lot of us are still hiding, and uh, you know, we're, we're still trying to make excuses for something else, but you know, all these cells, and, and, and everybody up here will agree, when you've got the bull or the, or the female with a good phenotype and he checks all the boxes, they're gonna bring the big money. I mean, we see it every weekend, you know, you know, if it's in South Texas or if it's out in Georgia. The bulls with, and the females that check all the boxes have all the performance above, you know, average EPDs and uh, with the phenotype to go along with it, those are the ones that are bringing the bigger money. You know, one of the things that, that uh, you, if you think about the big bull programs, Derek's, uh, Trey's, and all the different Collier Farms, um, it's, it's great to identify those cattle that excel in all those different categories, but one of the best and quickest herd improvement tools out there is your culling program. You know, when you cull from the bottom end, you, you probably improve your herd quicker than anything else that you can do. And, you know, all these tools helps you identify those bulls that are on the bottom end. You know, even if they look good, if they're not performing and what, uh, most time it's gonna work hand in hand. But when it identifies those cattle that are in the lower percentiles and you take those out, you go to, you know, go to a different market, uh, cut the heads off or whatever you do, that's one of the best things you can do. When you go to a sale, you, you, know, you should expect not to see any or many of those bulls that are on the lower side. You know, those bulls that are there, they've qualified, be it on looks, be it on you know, performance or EPDs. Because uh, uh, in some of these cases, these guys are starting with two, three, like Derek said, 450 bulls. So when you end up with... 150 there, you know, they're going to be the top end. And it's a lot of tools that you utilize to, to get, get those bulls to that program. Well, that's going to be up to you guys. That's not up to us. No way, Jose. Do not try to put that crud on us. No. You satellites or you co-ops or you producers set up your own requirements, and we will dang sure be right there with you helping you. But you cannot stick that back up there and say, oh, the sale manager said. No, that's not going to happen. You can do that today, buddy, and set it up. And we will back you. I guarantee you, everybody up here will back you. But don't tell us to set it up. Well, I didn't, I didn't take it away from you. I, I know what you're asking. <laughs> no. Yeah. That's what he was but, going to. No. <laughs> First of all, we've got to get everybody doing it. You know what I mean? And uh, we're a long way from that. Um, as Derek and some other guys said up here, I mean, you look in the catalog, and we still on a lot of these cattle, we don't even have weaning weights. 
you know, I don't understand that, but uh, every individual group, like Bruce just said, you know, they're going to have to make that determination in their own market area. Well, how are we going to come up with what the standard should be for a docking fee or cattle? Well, you got to start somewhere. Um, okay. And, you know, a two something IMF in one herd, you know, might be a three in another herd. So we need to understand that, too. But we got to start somewhere. Uh, but until we get enough cattle, I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, you know, other than some of these bull programs, especially a consignment sale. Where in the world are we going to get enough cattle to eat, that even have all the data, uh, much less have a standard that they have to meet? You just look at the BBU breed averages and the percentiles, and then your group can decide that you're not going to admit animals that are below a certain percentile in BBU data. Steve, I think but you got to get market. everybody doing it, guys. You can use all the percentiles and everything you want, but you got to get everybody participating, everybody weighing, everybody doing this first. But that's why we're requiring every animal has to have the data in order to be eligible for the sale. And that's the number one thing that's getting people off their butts to do it. Well, and as and the market's going to dictate that. Yeah, I, I guarantee you that when somebody walks up to your place and they start asking for a particular category, be it a wean and weight or an IMF or whatever it is, uh, whether you have it or don't have it, or, but if a buyer shows up and, and, and is interested, and uh, and he's and you you'll be able to tell real quick if he's looking for that, and if you have it, you're going to realize the the value of it. And you're going to uh, put the emphasis on it. But if you don't have it, you're going to realize the loss of that value. And so many of those things dictate where we're going to go. And in time, uh, you know that that value may determine itself. It's gonna keep rising as it goes. You, like he said, you've gotta have some place to start. Uh, and as we follow that market, and, and that's the thing we're always gonna do, it's gonna push us, it's gonna push us faster, and, and, uh, uh, and we'll come up with those things. Realize those things that are more important over others. I think a lot of the things that they just said hold true for us as an association from the standpoint of there's going to be differences, and there's going to be differences from program to program, uh, even those that are in the same program, from herd to herd, there's going to be some, some pretty vast differences out there. So uh, hopefully most of you have seen some of the new performance articles that we're including in the Cowman on a monthly basis, uh, trying to better explain some of the performance criteria, uh, how we collect that criteria, and how we can better use that uh, and, and better understand some of the performance measures that we're collecting out there. So. Uh, I would agree that, that trying to get everyone on board and recent years of the inventory programs and trying to get people to, to better report the data that's out there and all the data that's out there in an accurate manner is where we're, where we're st stemming from and, and trying to grow the, the opportunity to, to move this stuff forward. So uh, certainly agree. Yeah, I think before you, uh, Michael goes, I think it's already happening, Steve. The Seed Stock Marketing Committee is supposed to be working on some uh, pretty basic uh, guidelines to possibly give these other satellites and stuff like that to work off of, whether it be color, performance, whatever it might be, just as a base for them to work off and then tailor it to fit their own needs wherever they're at, maybe turn it in and make sure all the boxes are checked or the scan data is turned in or, or whatever it is. So I think it, it starts out at the ground level. Um, for you guys that aren't involved in a satellite, I know it's an extra $35. Um, you know, traditionally through the years, we've seen that the retention rate of those guys that do get involved in satellites um, seem to stick around a little bit longer and, and uh, can work with those guys on, on what they need to get done. So I'd encourage every one of you, if you're not involved in at least one satellite, to do so and kind of keep up to date. And that's the way that it filters from the board to the satellites and to you, the people, the members. So, uh, you know, that's, that's one thing that I would point out. All right, you guys travel from ranch to ranch all over the country. What products of feed have you seen consistently uh, improve the health or condition of your customer's cattle? Say that again. I wear hearing aids and I can't see. <laughs> All right. Uh, but you're not very old. What, what products or feed have you guys seen consistently help the condition of your customer's cattle? What, 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 
when you're visiting. You guys travel from ranch to ranch all over the country, uh, probably more than anybody in this room. So uh, what, what products would you recommend on uh, improving your herd's health and condition? I would, I would, you know, I think it varies in different regions. There's different feed mills and whatever. I would work with that, that feed mill or whatever in your hometown and tell them what your goal is. Um, what I see a lot of, uh, you know, and when I was helping Anthony is, is under conditioned cattle that people thought you could put it on in 30 days or 45. You know, instead of blowing them up and trying to do it in 45 days, start out there 90 or 100 days out, just kind of ease them into it. And, uh, you know, these feed mills and, and feed stores, they deal with people that are doing this stuff all the time, either whether it be developing bulls once you get them weaned or, or whatever it might be. So I think it's a little too broad of a, uh, a question or specific of a question, and it's, I have more of a broad answer. But, um, you know, I think it is give yourself plenty of time to condition those animals to whatever you're wanting to do. Um, you know, don't wean your calf, go throw them out on grass and let them starve to death. Um, it, it doesn't do any good for his development either. From my, from my perspective, I'm going to tell you this. Every region is different. You know, like Derek said, everyone's got a different mill or different, something different than that. My recommendation, though, is find the product that works for you. The biggest thing I see in the industry, uh, if you're producing seed stock cattle, they should be special. Uh, we used to call them special sale. We didn't call them anything but because the cattle look special. If, if you're going to invest the time, the effort, and everything to be in this business, uh, don't, like Derek said, don't wean your heifer and kick them out there and forget about them. A lot of people will do that, but even worse with their bull calves. They don't like to mess with them. They'll kick them in the farthest pasture and get them up when they're 16 months old thinking they can make them look, look like herd bulls. You know, I tell people all the time, these cattle are your registered cattle. They're your seed stock cattle. Let them look the part. If it's dry, they're going to need some help. If it's other things, but, uh, you know, I go to some programs and, and you know, we're, if it's a new place, you're driving up looking for it. And you can, some places you can spot them when, as soon as you get there. It looks like a seed stock program. These cattle need to look the part. Uh, I get a lot of, I go on a lot of people's places and they say, man, I just, you know, I'm not going to feed them. I'm going to do this and do that. Well, that's a little different program. You're not going to look the part. These buyers, when they come looking for them, whether they come from a commercial background or a different breed or whichever way, they expect those cattle to look different. So whatever means you can find to, to get them there for your area, for your pasture, for, you know, whatever you're doing. Uh, but the, probably the, the biggest thing that I see day in and day out are cattle that just aren't cared for enough to be the part or to perform like seed stock cattle should. Mike, I think, uh, let's say, let's narrow it down to a feed stuff, you know, sale preparation. Um, the biggest mistake that I see people make, and they're, all of you buy your feed from different places, but the biggest mistake I see people make is, is trying to save money and buying feed that's not at least 70% total digestible nutrients, okay? You're feeding a bunch of junk and a bunch of fiber. So to me, if we're talking about cell preparation, to get them to eat as much as you need them to eat, that's the main thing to me. I mean, if you think about it, you know, feed one at 70 versus 50, and then look at your cost difference, you're really saving money. I think what he's saying is you got to go in every area and see what's what's available to you. And if you don't if you don't trust or know the co-op or the feed mill, go to another producer around there that you see his cattle looking good and healthy and fat and his pastures are pretty. Go to that guy. Talk to that guy. What do you do? How do you make that look that way? I don't care whether it's a beef master person or somebody else. If they've got good looking, healthy cattle. Go meet that person, find out what he's using. Because everything varies in the different areas of the country as far as minerals and the feed substance. What Mike says is 100% right, but you need to go find a really good high quality mineral. Make sure your minerals are right on your cattle. Biggest mistake made in my opinion is minerals. We watch people come in bringing animals into the sale that are just all over the place. Uh, some of them will bring in uh, bags of 12% commodity feed uh, there's a couple of guys, if you sneak out and look in their truck, because they'll be bringing it in in a bucket, they don't want you to see it, but it says show feed on it. They are pampering and trying to really polish those animals up before they bring them to a sale. 
and there's other guys that bring them in straight out of the pasture and they get a flake of hay in their pen and that's it and the cattle look rough and they sell accordingly. Yeah, and I, I think the other important thing is not just what you can get there, but, but you don't need to forget where you are, what region you're in. You know, if, if you're in South Louisiana and your grass on a good day is 5% protein or 6, you cannot compare it to the cattle out in West Texas where they're, you know, Northwest Texas where they're 14% on a bad day. Um, you know, so, so if you're going to pick those kind of cattle to fit that environment, you need to pick a different type of cattle if you're not going to help them out. Um, no matter if it's a liquid feed or whatever. Now, to answer your question, I am a fan of long range. It does cost a little more, but I do believe in it. So I think of, so I think a good point that, and Derek alluded to it earlier, and you've heard us talk about it a lot lately, is we have those satellites, those marketing groups that are spread out across the country, from the West Coast to the East Coast and everywhere in between. Uh, you go to any one of these guys and they've got sponsors, and people that are helping them, and we got a room full of them over there today uh, that are from this region and this area. But they're they're there for a reason. Utilize those guys. Uh, you could you could talk to every single one of those guys up there, and they've all got partners that they use. Now it's going to be different from region to region that they go to. Uh, most of them, some of them, some of them use a, a certain line of product. Some of them use a certain company's product, or some of them use a certain distributor that handles several different products. But they know the things that are working in the certain areas. Uh, it's, it's hard to talk about, like you said, in a broad spectrum because it's a little bit different everywhere you go. But I would certainly encourage you to start at that satellite or marketing group level because there's a lot of information there. There's a lot of things that they can help you with and, and get you in touch with the people that. Gentlemen, um, it seems like every, where we, every meeting we have, um, here is uh, the overriding emphasis is uh, performance data, and rightly so, and I think that's one of the reasons our cattle are becoming more acceptable in the breed and, and all this. And yet, um, in certain areas where, uh, you know, our beef master cattle have been for a, a long time, uh, we have no productions, there are no uh, consignment sales. Um, it seems as though the, as the cattle acceptability has grown, the marketing accessibility has contracted. Um, I think one of the reasons is is this data, and the if if we don't have the the opportunity to get our cattle scanned, like in North Carolina and South Carolina, we have one scan technician. And uh, that's, that makes it very, very difficult for, for us to work. Uh, and, and my point is this. Some 10 or 12 years ago, VBU said that they were going to train technicians, they were going to have the technicians on the staff, and that they were going to send them out, make it uh, scanning and, and that data. Um, you know, not only uh, we can send it in, but you're going to facilitate the opportunity to, to get that data. Would you gentlemen not? feel or encourage BBU to follow through on that program? Do you not think it would increase our, our marketing uh, areas uh, in, in the country because it would make us uh, more uh, in compliance with, with uh, you know, the breed requirements and that sort of thing? I don't know the exact figure now, but we're probably 50 or $60,000 advertiser budget at BBU. And the Southeast has suffered because of that indirect answer to your question that uh, subject was discussed at the BBU board meeting on Thursday about training the the uh, field service representatives and having them carry the equipment um, and it was done back when uh, Jerry Hemphill and John Newbern were uh, technicians but the the big stumbling block and as I understood it on Thursday was a cost it's fairly cheap to buy a computer but those scanning wands about 70,000 bucks a piece and Colin can probably give you more information on it, but I know it's been talked about in the BBU Board of Directors, but uh, decisions have to be made on what's going to be the most economically viable way to go. Well, you know, you, and you make a great point, and, and uh, uh, some, a lot of y'all remember when we did uh, intend on buying the equipment and training our people to do so, but uh, it is expensive, and, and not everyone can be trained. Uh, all of those things go into it then it's going to become time consuming. The obvious answer there is, is try to find the technician right now. So if we trained our own people to do it, they're going to become very busy doing it. So 
so it's a it's a process. But I'm gonna I'll say something uh, that hopefully everybody will think about. If we're ever gonna get there, we're gonna have to grow our association. We're gonna have to make those things. If if we're gonna do it from within the association, our association needs to grow. It's gonna need the support of the industry. Uh, so when when you you know when you look at the people and what this association is trying to do. There's so many different directions that I see, and, and our association knows that it can go. On. You know, we're going as fast as we can, but uh, everything takes money, it takes people, it takes all those things. So when you get in these meetings and you talk about, uh, you know, the association needing money, spending money, raising money, and all those things, that's all part of that process of growing to get where we would want to be and need to be. As a breed, uh, something that I hear, and I think these other guys have heard, um, the beef master breed is very, very lucky and fortunate that we, we refer to uh, consignment sales. Most everybody knows what it is, but we're one of the only breeds in the U.S. that has, probably the only breed that has satellites. Others have marketing groups, but we've got very well organized uh, satellites, each of which put on sales, field days, and all those different things, as do our marketing groups. I hear it from other breeds, uh, Brangus and Hereford and Sinatol, that one of our big advantages are our satellites and marketing groups and all the many sales that we do. You look at some of the other breeds, they have a number of big production sales or joint production sales. Uh, but you pick up the publications and you see a very limited them and they know that's one of the advantages we've got. Each of these sales, going back to your question about uh, the expenses or, or things such as that, when you look at all the number of sales being produced all around the different parts of the country, when each of those satellites dedicates that amount of advertising dollars to it, it's promoting the breed, not just that event and everything, but it's the entire breed that is promoting. And over the years, I've seen that as one of the big, big benefits that we have. So, Roger, we do, we do from time to time try to sit down and look at opportunities that are out there and, and things that we can do. And, and we've kicked around the idea again recently of, of trying to do something on the scan tech side because it's a, it's a nationwide problem, I'll assure you. Uh, there's a lot of cattle in Texas. There's not a scan tech south of I-10. So there's still a lot of cattle south of I-10 that we've got to go find somebody. But like I said, there's about three or four that we use on a routine basis in Texas, but half or more of those spend more time outside of Texas, and, and it is a struggle. But, yeah, it's been cost prohibitive uh, is what slowed us down in, in recent years. I know. Uh, talking with John and Jerry a little bit in previous years and other board members, they actually went to the school to get certified. Uh, some of the equipment was purchased and for whatever reason, I don't know if it was uh, the certification process, if it was cost at that time, it didn't ever materialize to, to where it was. But uh, for us right now, it's, it's staff, uh, staff time, the ability of those guys to get around uh, and then the expense of, of getting started in there. I got a good wrap up question for you guys. <clears throat> it's not on performance. One of the things that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that I've known or noticed over the years, and this pertains to member retention probably as much as anything, and you guys get uh, bullets shot at you over this issue from time to time, but one of the biggest problems I see with breeders and especially retention is unrealistic expectations. Um, and we were talking about marketing cattle and this, that, and other. You know, a lot of people can raise good cattle or they can do this, but there's that emotional factor that gets involved with breeders, especially seed stock breeders, because, hell, these are our babies. You know, we, we live with them every day. We name them. We do all this stuff for them. And then we go up there and we've paid ten or 20000 for this animal. We go to the first sale and it brings $3,000. Um, how do you all deal with unrealistic, uh, unrealistic expectations? And what would you say is a realistic budget when you buy an animal for 10000 Let's use that. I mean, should they go out and sell one for 10000 right away? Or, you know, should they look at, like Bruce said, their plan and, and really what, what y'all can suggest to them so that they're maybe not disillusioned from the beginning? Well, I can tell you I was, was asked a question just your, your animal may be just as good as somebody else that's been around 20 or 30 years and has a lot of name recognition, it's not going to bring the same price. That's just a fact of life. Until you've been around and 
taken a few knocks and, and got some recognition and participated in some sales where people recognize your name, uh, then they're not going to be likely to, to pay as much for the animal. Um, and number two, you've just got to keep working at it and plug at it. Um, don't expect, uh, just because you paid a lot of money for an animal, that its offspring are going to bring the same thing. That's just the reality. Um, and just be as honest with them as you can. We've got, a, as I said a while ago, a lot of new people in our area. There's a lot of young people. Uh, I talked to Craig this morning. In the last month, he signed up five new BBU members. He's driving uh, Monty crazy at the office because uh, every time he sells an animal to somebody or talks to them, he's getting them signed up and getting them involved with Beef Masters. And we just try to keep telling them the truth and to help them as long as much as we can. I think what you brought up, Trey, is a great point. There is unrealistic expectations all the time, and it happens from a new guy that's brand new to a guy that's been around 15, 20 years that may have progressed to a point that now he wants to compete and thinks he's got the quality to compete. It's all boils back to quality, and what I personally do is I try to relate that to that person that, look, we're talking about quality, and I totally disagree with what Dave said. I'm sorry, but I've got first-year people that have gone out and competed with 30-year people and kicked their butts. And it has nothing to do with their name. It has to do with the quality of the daggum product that you put in front of the buying people. So I've got examples of that all day long where you can do that in this breed. It's the reason I love this breed is because that can happen in this breed. It does not happen in some other breeds. But you can go out, work your product, work your plan, and when you go pay 10000 for this animal, then I talk to them about having a realistic expectation of what a calf, a bull, a heifer out of that particular animal may potentially bring at a sale. Where does it fit? What's the quality of that animal? You know, all those questions that, that we go through talking about all the time. And sometimes you buy a $10,000 animal and you've got to call that darn calf. Well, that's not fun. But that's the reality of this business is that it's all quality conscious as far as I'm concerned. We all have, uh, all there sitting up here have different personalities. Um, three of us, and only because I don't know the other two, three of us have been doing this a total of 115 years. You know, 30 years, 30 years, 50 years as Anthony said. So we all have different personalities. Uh, Trey, if you asked how we handle that, you know each one of our personalities, you know how we handle it. but. Uh, it's more of a one-on-one -on -one situation. I, I don't see that problem when I'm able to speak with uh, somebody one-on-one. -on -one. It's the guy that doesn't ask the questions uh, to me or Bruce or Anthony or any of these other guys what I need to do to maximize the profit of my animal and actually listen to us, okay, to the best of their ability. We don't have problems with the guys that ask those questions. It's the ones that don't. And we want them to ask those questions. I mean, that's something that we want, I want, and I think everybody up here, wants the consigner, to me, a, a successful sale, whether it be one animal consignment or your production sale, is when I leave that sale, that seller is happy. It doesn't matter how much money it brought to me. It's whether that seller is happy. And I leave there and that seller is happy. And I leave Mackey's place and he had a good sale and he's happy even if I thought we could have done more. If he's happy, I'm elated. You know. Well, you know, Trey, you make a good point, and I think I coined the phrase year, years ago, is unreal expectation. And that says a lot. Uh, you get a lot of people that come to, to cattle with, you know, they may have started with good genetics or high-dollar cattle and uh, uh, didn't do their homework and they're not prepared right. We've covered some of those things. Uh, we deal with it a lot. And I've also used that same term, uh, when you hear of people that do well, and, and I always say, well, it's not an accident they did well. They did their homework. And so when I deal with, with unreal expectations and when you deal with consignment sales, you're going to see more of it there than anywhere because you've got so broad a uh, range of people that, uh, you know, people are members and people are breeders. And there's a big difference from somebody that's just a member versus someone who's a breeder and learned to be a breeder and learned to be a better breeder, a seed stock breeder, and there's those big differences. But uh, there's times I enjoy talking with people when they come because they've had unreal expectations. They want to know why their cattle didn't sell. 
and, and I think uh, Bruce or Mike pointed out that uh, when you come up and ask the question, why didn't mine sell, sell well, I feel like that's one of the most sincere questions they can have, and I'll take the time and visit with them uh, well. Typically, if it's, that animal's fresh on their mind, well, you open the catalog, and then you point out that, well, you know, you didn't have the weaning weights, or you didn't have these things, and there's different reasons why. You know, we, when I say that, you know, certain people seem to win futurities, or certain people seem to sell high, well, there's so much that goes into it. You know, the preparation, uh, again, it's not an accident there on the front end. They're experienced breeders, they know what they're doing, and they've done their homework. They've provided everything that they can to make that animal a true seed stock animal. Uh, yeah, Bruce said we've had people that get into it, and in a short time, they go to a maturity, and, and I've seen people with 10 head, 5 head, 30 head that win those maturities, but they've done their homework. They've made the cattle look like seed stock cattle. Uh, the quickest unreal expectations come from people that, that show up and, and uh, they think that just because they got them in that sale, they're going to sell on a par with the, with the top end. If you go to those sales and you're honest with yourself, you're going to see it's the, it's the people that, that do their homework, that, uh, that are prepared, and, and it's not an accident that they, that they do well. Huh? No, I've, I've been waiting. <laughs> but uh, all of us has been at a point in our life when we're raising cattle and we decide we want to take it up to the next level. Uh, maybe we've been getting 2,500 ahead for our cattle, and we want to be at that $5,000, $10,000 level. What is the recommendations you all make to us as breeders on how to take that next step and move up the ladder? Oh, I've been told before, but I'd like to share well, it with you, everyone. You know what I'm going to say. It's improvement of the product. Uh, there's people in this room that average $10,000, there's people that average $2,500. Even the ones that average $10,000 have improvement to make. Uh, there, there is not a cap on the quality that these cattle can reach. And talking about all the things, all the things we have to put in them uh, to make them more marketable. That's it in a nutshell. I think it's that simple. It's improve your quality. It's quality, baby. That's all it is. Improve your quality, figure out what it is, that's where it'll get it. It's just, it's just that simple. AI, embryo, if you like it, if you can live through the embryo ups and downs of that emotional roller coaster, some people can, some people can't. But AI is an easy one that everybody can utilize. Herd bull selection, all of the tools that we've been talking about all day, use them all to improve your quality and back up that quality with all this. Predictable genetics, the, all the stuff that you have on all the data. Put it all together in that neat package. That's how you're gonna move from one level to the next. Mackie, there's some things that, that uh, I'm still amazed that people don't do, but there's, there's little things that you can do to really take some some big steps you know simple things like weaning weights you know we've always talked about you know the pluses and minus yeah you got to have a scale but if you're going to be a seed stock breeder that should be the one of the first things you get but you evaluate your program you consider all the tools that are out there and see what's effective for you one of my quickest things that i always recommend people i say well what can i do what's the one step that i can do one of, to me one of the first steps after you've learned to do weaning weights and all those things if you don't incorporate an AI program. Years ago, an AI program was, was pretty tough, you know, before, without the technology. Now with heat synchronizations and, and everything we've learned over the years, uh, yeah, it's still a little expensive and, and, and what, but of all the tools that are out there, to me it's one of the simplest, but when you can reach out there and find and make use of all the powerful bulls that are out there across the country and everywhere, that's your number one tool. You know, the next might be, the embryo program, but it gets a little more complicated and you know it gets more expensive. So evaluate your program, know where you want to do, and figure those tools that, that are going to work best for your program. And a marketing program where the best producers in the world, in the United States, and any kind of agriculture products, we are predominantly the worst marketers of our product in the world, agriculture product. 
I just got Each a note producers. from somebody up here, but I'm going to point out. The other thing that we do, and I touched on it a minute ago and I didn't finish, but when you talk about these satellites, every one of these satellites when we do a sale involves an advertising budget. And uh, as long as I can remember, we've got publications out there. You know, we've talked about the, uh, the Common Magazine, and, you know, the point was made that, well, we don't put a full page in there. I do every time. That's number one. That's the breed association. And you pick up and you say, well, it's no accident some of these folks do better. It, it's funny how it uh, times in. You open the, uh, the Cowman magazine, and those guys that you see in there every month, every month, and the next month on the front page, on the back page, it just so happens that those guys are also the ones that tend to do better. Advertising is one of the biggest things you can do. If you go home, even if you're not going to advertise in the Cowman, advertise in your region, in your local publication, but, uh, you know, you're, you have to reach those customers and those prospective customers out there somewhere. And, and that's, that's, that's probably your number one tool to, to step your cattle from 2,500 to 3,500 and so, and so on. I totally concur with that, Anthony. I've been a big worker in Lone Star for years, and it's one of the satellites one of the toughest things we have to do is education. Um, I would say, you know, y'all are probably the Neiman Marcus, and we're all the way down to garage sale trying to get everybody up to Neiman Marcus. And so anytime anybody can come to one of our sales and your face is there, you're there, we always have somebody from BBU, but it really helps to let everybody know we are one, we are one group. And we're, it's not the BBU doesn't care about us or this, that, or the other, and we can't get winning wages. If, we, if any of y'all could help come to a sale one time and just come have a free steak dinner with us, it sure would be appreciated. Can you do those on weekdays? <laughs> <laughs> well, we certainly appreciate these guys coming up here. I do have, have one last question for you. I know Bruce has referenced uh, a plan often, uh, and several others have talked about what they do and what the, the process is. Just briefly, if you could have something that these guys could take away uh, that helps them begin that plan or begin that process, uh, the one or two things that they can do to, to help get them on their way. Well, the number one thing, on, in my opinion, is you start looking down the road a year, two years in advance, sit down, think about what size you're going to be, how many cattle can you actually run on the acres that you own, or are you going to lease ground, but determine what your big program is going to be. If you can't determine that, then whatever you've got, five head, 10 head, 200 head, 1,000 head, I don't care, whatever you've got, let's make a plan on how we're going to market these cattle, how we're going to breed these cattle, how we're going to advertise these cattle, but sit down and walk through all the steps Go back to Wendy's program that she put up here. She's got it all spelled out better than I've ever seen before. And I've been around this stuff for 35 years. And she did a wonderful job this morning. If you'll go back and look at that, that's the greatest way to put together a plan I can tell anybody, Colin. And then when you get that, now we start talking about, okay, are we going to AI these cattle? And here's how we're going to AI. Here's when we're going to AI. Here's when our calves are going to be gone, calved. Here's when they're not going to be calved. Here's where what bulls we're going to be able to, to put into any of these sales that are co-op bull sales. Can we put them in there? When do they got to be born? You got to look at all the different questions that are out there, work them into your plan, and then start working it. And my takeaway would be make the freaking plan. Sit down and talk with one of us. Sit down and talk with your wife, your partner, your ranch manager, but make a plan. And then don't be afraid to ask questions. All the guys up here, just like Mike was talking about, we're around all day gun time. Ask a question. Every one of us will give you an answer. You may not like it, but you'll get an answer. I'd say look at the successful operations in your area. Uh, go visit as many ranches as you can. Look for a program and how they operate. Um, if you want to, it kind of goes back to Mackie's question. If you want to improve if somebody's doing a really good job in getting maximum prices at the sale and you want to try to step up to that, Tom Laster said, if you want to copy somebody's herd, 
go by the best genetics from that person that you possibly can, and after three generations, you're going to be 75% of the way there. Go buy the good genetics. Buy, go talk to those people. Get their animals and, and work your program. That's exactly what Bruce said. you still got to be a plan, but look at the good operations in your area and do the things that they're doing and try to do them yourself. Well, let's give these guys a round of applause. We greatly appreciate their time. And there's no doubt that, that there, there is a wealth of knowledge up here as they talked about the experience, the years of experience that they have, uh, the avenues that they've been down. They've seen things that work and those that don't work. So don't hesitate to reach out to these guys, grab them, pull them aside, and, and pick their brain because they are a, a great resource that we have. We certainly appreciate you all. Thank you all.